Many, many thanks to um, Exceptional Minds and to Ariel for that wonderful video introduction. Thanks to the California Community Foundation for their support this evening. And many thanks to all of you for coming out tonight uh, for this very, very special evening. Um, it's uh, truly my pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Mr. Ron Suskind. Uh, Ron is truly a unique talent. Um, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, best-selling author, a teacher, um, and a father. Um, he's among our most honored journalists, having written several extraordinarily influential books about uh, the social landscape today. Um, he's an embodiment of what you might call the, the public intellectual, somebody who really has moved beyond his formal education and background to really provide a, a very broad and enlightened perspective on everything from modern politics to social interactions. Um, when I was speaking with Ron beforehand, he had a slightly different way of describing himself. He said his family was kind of like the Jewish Kardashians. Uh, I, I guess they're doing a documentary film right now, so they're filmed a lot, but he'll tell you more about that himself. <laughs> Um, Ron is the author of uh, four books that have been on the New York Times bestseller lists and the critically acclaimed A Hope in the Unseen, An American Odyssey from the Inner City to the Ivy League. His other books include Confidence Men, The Way of the World, The One Percent Doctrine, and The Price of Loyalty. He is one of the most influential chroniclers of the, American pre the modern American presidency, having written very um, insightful insider books about the presidencies of both George W. Bush and Barack Obama. He was the senior affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal for a number of years where he won his Pulitzer Prize and is currently the senior fellow at Harvard Center for Ethics. He also has received the single greatest, uh, achieved the greatest distinction any uh, modern writer can, having been interviewed three times on The Daily Show, <laughs> America's most respected news program. Um, we're, we're deeply honored that Ron has been able to join us here this evening. He's highly sought after speaker uh, because of his uh, gift for conveying uh, really uh, complex stories in extraordinarily compelling ways to which we can relate. Um, he has spent his career really surveying and talking about the social and political landscape. You know, before I do one of these, I always get somebody's bio, and there's this intriguing line in Ron's bio that says that his audiences have ranged from White House conferences to Hollywood directors to incarcerated felons. And I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere um, about keeping your audiences straight, but I'm not going to go there because I know we have, we don't have felons here tonight. Um, Ron's groundbreaking book, Life Animated, is what he's really going to be talking with us about this evening. And it lifts the curtain on his 20 year journey, the 20 year journey of his family with his son Owen uh, through his diagnosis of autism. The story is not really just about the disorder of autism. At its core, it's about human redemption. It's about uh, the power of imagination to really change the course of a life. Um, it is about uh, an extraordinarily loving and caring family and the, the power of a father's love in many ways. Uh, before the program this evening, uh, Ron got a call from Owen and I uh, had the privilege of listening when they were talking on speaker, and it was just such a loving and warm relationship. It, it really was heartwarming to see, uh, up close and personal, really, the, the nature of the interaction. So uh, with that introduction, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Ron Suskind. Thank you, Andrew. That was lovely. Lovely, lovely. This is... Uh, Great fun uh, to be here. Um, I go around and about, and I do speak from time to time. But, but you know, to be here in the land of story seems just right. The story makes sense of everything important about ourselves. But you know, we couldn't have imagined how the story would turn out. We thought we knew. We were pretty sure of ourselves back when, 20 years ago. 
you know, a couple things I hear in my head. One is uh, from my uh, mother. She's a little woman from Brooklyn about this tall, which is, and still a disappointment to his mother. She wanted much better than this. Just, law school, that number one. When they give you the Pulitzer Prize, they fight family up. It was fun up in Florida from the, the polo club in Boca, yeah, <laughs> named after the great line of great Jewish polo stars. So, <laughs> so you know, like one-on-one, you can negotiate decent Bosnia, but in front of a group, she tightens up. So, you know, she's a big, giant baroni table. Up. This is Mrs. Susskind, would you like to say a little something? She stands up, but no one realizes it because she's on her talk. <laughs> it's no surprise, right? She looks this way and that. I can't help her. She's way over. So I suppose at this point, it's all right for you to go to law school. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I love that woman. I was raised under a kind of motivational methodology that's familiar, I'm sure, to many people in the room. You know, my mother didn't say it in so many words, but more or less, when I'm small. She says, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. I just won't mention your name to other people, just so you know that. Which <laughs> is kind of the way it works. And later, when I'm a reporter for the journal, I would sit with women. You know, they happen to be Jewish women, but they could be any woman of a certain age. And after a half an hour, 45 minutes, I'm like, so there's a son other than the doctor. Oh, right, yeah, there is one, yeah, a teacher. What's wrong with the teacher? <laughs> so that was where I came from. My father died when I was a kid, and I'll finish up about me in a second. But, you know, it's interesting how you're the product of a kind of conversation that goes on between your parents. You don't realize till later what they're really talking about. So my dad uh, is, a, you know, a guy who was very much at ease in the world, and he married this ferocious little Brooklynite. She kind of made him a success, as she says. But he's, he's 46, and he has to write a letter to me and my brother. And he writes this letter. Um, with the first sentence is, I hope uh, you two boys never read this letter. But I cannot ignore what the doctors have told me. And of course, it's a letter that, as per instructions, is given to us posthumously. It talks about living the worthwhile life. Beautiful. I mean, he says a couple things before which are fascinating. I mean, you know, the letter doesn't change. It's frozen in time. I change. And as I grow, I see more and more of what he's saying. But at one point, he says something interesting. He says, just remember, you boys don't owe me and your mother anything. You have given us more by being a presence in our life than we ever possibly could give to you. Uh, my mother actually disagrees with that on almost every level. I work my fingers to the bone for both of you. That's alone, and you were teenagers. But at the end, he says something that's profound. He says, one thing I'll ask of you. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Don't compromise there. Time is precious. This life is so precious. Stick with worthwhile, and everything will work out. So there, there I was trying to fulfill both dictates. Which puts me at 31, 32 years old as a Wall Street Journal reporter. And everything's working out. It's all as you'd hoped, all as we wanted. Two beautiful kids, Walter Five, Owen Two and a Half. We're leaving Boston for Washington for a dream job. I'm going to be the senior national affairs reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I mean, the job you got to kill people to get. And I killed 10 guys to get the job. <laughs> Family men, good guys. Uh, my mother's like, only 10. I thought we'd be more than that. <laughs> and we got in the moving van, and we went south. Full of a sense of possibility. Seeing all the things we were taught to want. A couple weeks down in Washington in the rented house in Georgetown, I stop telling Cornelia what's going on at the office, the new office, this exciting new life, because she has stories to tell, what's going on in the house. So I go, well, today, let me tell you what happened today. Well, he's, he's not using the big boy cup anymore. I said, he graduated to the big boy cup a year and a half ago. Owen is just shy of three. He's now back to the sippy cup, the baby cup. He's walking around like someone who's drunk with their eyes closed. 
He won't look at me. You know, he had the usual two and a half year old speech, a few hundred words. This might have been in there. I love you, let's get ice cream over my Ninja Turtles. Two, three months into Washington, he's down to one word, juice. And then I know something is wrong. It makes no sense. It's a little bit. Kids don't grow backwards. How could he lose what he had? And then we go see a doctor. He says, you gotta see a specialist. And then we see a specialist. Lovely woman. A little vicious, white coat. A specialist. She watches Owen walk. She watches him sit on the rug and play with his hands. She sits us down in the chair. She says, this is called autism. You know, what do we know? It's 1994, we knew Rain Man. But we knew 1998, that, when 1988, that movie comes out. So everyone saw that. And then I didn't hear anything else after that. This moment, it could have happened last Tuesday. That's how vivid it is for us. Cornelia and I are sitting in the chairs. Owen is on the rug, and the woman is talking. It sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. I can't hear anything. We're not even in our bodies. We're floating up near the ceiling. Looking down on these two little people frozen in their chairs. You know, we left those people in that room. They didn't follow us out the door. But we were in the car. Ten minutes, ten minutes into the drive home, we've already demonized this doctor. <laughs> Crucial. Denial. Huge. A friend of mine, later, a psychiatrist, a brilliant guy, I was asking him about denial. Another incident, something else that happened. He's a, he's a Cuban. Cuban Jew. He's a, <laughs> he's a psychiatrist, brilliant guy. He's like, denial, yes, let me explain to you. You young people, his friend, his son is like my best friend. It's all truth, truth, truth with you. Denial. When we cannot face the truth, it's what human beings do. It's a very important mechanism. You must respect denial. I didn't respect it, I didn't even recognize it. All I know is he's silent. He will not speak and he will not look at us. And we're in a panic. We got to another doctor after the tall woman, we called her the ice queen, the, the first specialist, pushing her away. We got another doctor who suddenly somehow I felt kinship with. Brilliant man. The, the Jewish guy about that tall. And uh, <laughs> Alan Rosenblatt. He said, you know, a lot of them don't get their speech back, so you should be prepared for that. Okay. What do you do for a living? He said. I me? Mean, I said, I'm a reporter. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He said, well, help me. I don't understand. Well, you just paid me $150 for this hour. It's not covered. And you got four of me a week. Huh. He said, you're pretty good with numbers? He said, yeah, mitz and mitz. Private equity, nice, a nice idea. I said, oh, Jesus. He said, I'm a reporter, I'm a writer, I make stories, that's what I do, it's my career. He said, you better be pretty good at it. So it's gonna be a rough road. We were just terrified. The only thing Owen seemed to like to do, after being jerked around to every therapist we could find, the only thing he liked to do was something he liked to do before the onset of the autism, which is watch the Disney animated movies. Now at his age, now 23, they were everything. Disney had a couple of decades in the trough, and then he got roaring back. 1989 with a movie uh, called The Little Mermaid. Anyone here ever see that movie? Oh, let me see show it. Bigger. And the Disney Corporation thinks all of you. Uh, everyone watched it. It was the biggest movie of the year, and Beauty and the Beast as well, and then Aladdin and The Lion King. Everyone watched it. Everyone had those little clamshell boxes. And he watched the movie over and over again. We asked the doctor, is it all right? He's watching it. Yeah, yeah well, tell me. Does he seem settled? Yes. Does he seem, well, comforted? Yes. Okay. I. Let's watch it. No reason to cut it off. Not yet. A year passes. 
The only thing we can do as a family is watch The Little Mermaid. We're up to 109 viewings at this point. We're up in the bedroom on a cold November night watching a particular part of The Little Mermaid. That was a part where uh, Ariel, our protagonist, has to make a trade with Ursula the Sea Witch. You know, Ariel is a selfish girl. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? She's got everything. Everything, but not satisfied. She, she now works at Goldman Sachs. She's doing fine. She's a partner. <laughs> she wants her man. She'll trade anything to get her man. So, we're watching. Owen's motor function went to hell. The tippy cup, the sippy cup. Over the last couple of weeks, he's talking gibberish. Little sounds, we're excited, they're sounds. He's saying, juicer bows, juicer bows, juicer bows. Quit he wants more juice. Let's see who wants juice. We watch. Motor function went to hell with one exception. The thumb on the rewind button. <laughs> That's working. He's rewinding the part where Ariel cuts her deal. The sea witch says, look, it won't cost you much to be home in a trifle, really. Just your voice. Rewind. Cornelia and I are chatting. Wait, Walt is like, oh, and just watch the movie. Rewind. Third, read, fourth, rewind. Cornelia turns to me, it's not juice. I said, it's not juice, it's just. I grab Owen, just your voice. He looks at me for the first time in a year and says, juice or foes, juice or foes. And we all jumped on the bed. We called this our Helen Keller, Annie Sullivan moment. Water. The next day we go down, but we say, it was a breakthrough. He's in there. Okay, well, sit down, both of you. Let me explain this. This is called echolalia. Oh, Cornelia's like, I don't like the sound of that word. He's like, yeah, you're right about that. Is it an echo? Yeah. You're a very smart and pretty girl. Pretty girl, she says. It's an echo. It's like a parrot? Yeah. So, so we're left between Helen Keller and a pet store. That's where we spend years. Next year, it's Food Eli's Witten. Any guesses on what that is? 1992, animated classic. Booty, beauty, wise. You got it. Beauty wise within. If we go back to Rose and Black, go to Louis. If it's just nonsense to him, noise, how is he picking those three words out of 89 minutes of noise? Well, we know it. So that's where we live. Years pass. Cornelia used to be a journalist like me. That ended the day of the diagnosis. She's like, I have my job and you have yours. My job is 24-7 with him, and yours is to make more money than any journalist ever. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Eight, nine therapy sessions every week. 10, 15. Six and a half, Owen is up to a three-word sentence. I want juice. We consider that enormous progress. And we're living. We're bankrupt. Totally. We're borrowing money. But we're scared. We can't even really think about the future. We don't even think about it. We live in the present with him. Now you know almost the whole family. Me, my wife Cornelia, Owen. There's another actor that's important in the drama. The sibling. Walter. Do we have any siblings across the spectrum in the room? Can I see show hands? Mm. Let me just say that the Nobel Committee has a special prize for all of you. So sibling ends up being the key actor in so many of these life journeys. How the sibling changes. How the sibling grows. How the bond gets created. So Walter. Eight and nine is the world's most independent child. He needs nothing, he requests nothing. We love this. 
We celebrate it. This is a bad story, after all. This is a story we like to tell. Oh, my God, Walt, and anything the world throws at him, he can handle. First part of the story. Second part, and he'll never leave his little brother behind, ever. Those two together, that's the story we tell. Later, when I had to write the book, I had to sit Walter down at 24 years old and interview him with a reluctant White House source for the classified document. <laughs> Came up to our Vermont house, I said, buddy, I'm going to have to act like a reporter here. You have to tell me everything, even things that you'd never want to tell a dad, ever. You up to that? Now, now, Walt, as this independent kid, grows up and continues on the path of, of sovereignty. He was a football player. Uh, it's like a Jewish Marine. <laughs> he hits the beach and then feels guilty later. <laughs> He's tough. All right, Dad. All right, fire away. Well, Walt, you're so independent as a kid. That was one of the things. Yeah, I know. Let me explain to you what's really going on. Now, one of the stories my mom told uh, was about the first day of school when I'm in uh, first grade. I'm six years old. Yeah, it was me, mom, and Owen in the car. And, uh, and oh, yeah, you've told that a hundred times. Uh, and uh, five blocks away from the school, I tell mom, I'm good. I, I can take everything. Of course, Bernadette says, Walter, this is in Dickens. They know you have parents. I'm supposed to go in. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. First day of school, he goes in by himself. Then he rides his bike to school about a mile, even in the winter. Like he likes it. Well, let me explain. That first day of school it was me and mom and Owen in the car. And she brought me in. She'd have to bring out. And it would be about what's with your brother? I love him. I'd do anything for him. I mean, six year old boys are a tough crowd. And of course, I rode my bike to school in the winter. <clears throat> That's what's really going on. So Walter, the independent kid, is impenetrable every day of the year, except one, gets a little emotional on his birthday. Cornelia and I don't even notice. It doesn't fit our story of Walter. So on his ninth birthday, with Owen six and a half, Walter's in the backyard with his friends. They're playing. They're doing whatever they do on the birthday. The friends leave. Cornelia and I bring in the cups. And the plates and the cake, and Owen's back there with Walt, and Walt must have gotten a little emotional. Owen follows us into the kitchen. He's standing there. Three word sentence. Not much from him. He is looking at us more now. That's good. He has a funny look on his face, though, now. Like something's bubbling up. He looks at Cornelia and me, and back and forth, and he goes, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. And off he goes. It's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. First sentence. When we are struck silent, then we cannot stop talking for four hours. And after four hours, she's like, how do we get back in? Find a way in. Listen, I'm with them all day, every day. And I'm tired. I got to be up tonight because Owen doesn't sleep. Find a way in, would you? You're the crazy guy. You dress as a clown at the birthday party. You wear the propeller hat. Find a way. I go up to the bedroom, Owen's up there on the third floor, sitting on his bed, looking at a Disney book. We literally have taken out a second mortgage to buy Disney crap. Every <laughs> possible product. Yeah. He can't read, but he likes the picture. Other rug, one of those landings, you know, where the steps go right up. And I'm like, how do I find a way in? How do I find a way in? As I'm there, I see lying on its sides a puppet. Look at it be. It's a particular character. It's Yago. Jafar's evil side came from Aladdin. Owen oh, loves this character. One of those plush toys, $98 job. <laughs> I grab the puppet. I pull it on my arm. I crawl across the room. Silent. I don't want him to look at me. Right to the edge of the bed. So the bed spread over my head. I push the puppet up through the crease. And I say, Owen, Owen, what does it feel like to be you? That's good for 
godly boys and get your wondering. Anyone could do it. It's like a busted queen. Oh, and turns to the puppet. What, like he's bumping into an old friend. And he says, I'm not happy and I have no friends. I'm lonely. Now I bite down hard on the bedspread. Just stay in character. What would Yago say next? When did you and I become such good friends? When I watched the lad and he made me laugh. And then we talked to each other. Our first conversation, Yago and Owen. And after about two minutes of this, this bliss, I hear Owen clearing his throat. You know, <clears throat> it's up here. He's only six and a half. <clears throat> and then he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's Jafar in the villain. It's the next line of dialogue. And then I throw the bed right over. I'm like, ah, Owen, you're talking in dialogue. With a light went on. He memorized all 50 animated movies by Disney since Snow White in 1937. A sound. You threw him a line, you put it back the next line. And then you better be ready. He's going to outrun you. That was indisputable. So what we do is we start what we call the basement sessions. We go down to the basement. We got the TV ready because we're going to run out of line. We have to stop and no one should stay there. OK, what's my next line is blue. And then we keep doing it. And he's not just reciting, it seems. It seems like he's selling the emotions. Now, that could just be recitation. <clears throat> but the first night was Jungle Book. He loved that movie. And at one point along the way, I say, you know, Mowgli can make one great bear. And Owen says, do you think so, Papa Bear? And then he hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Mowgli or Mowgli or me and Owen. And of course, Cornelia says, it doesn't matter. And off we go. The house becomes insane. During the day, we go about our lives. Walter riding his bike to school, now 10 miles probably. <laughs> Cornelia driving Owen, hither and yon. Me and Owen to the Wall Street Journal. By day, I'm interviewing presidents. By night, I'm in the basement as an animated character. Lots of them. I mean, everything's in Disney. I mean, in, in the 50 movies, there's nothing that's not there. So we have become PhDs in Disney. I have a graduate degree in something else. But we all became PhDs. And we just use scenes. When it was time for bed, Cornelia would do Dumbo in the tree. And I would go to bed. In the morning, it's time to walk Annie, one of Owen's only jobs. We did 101 Dalmatians. Couple lines, we're good. We became, we became different people. In some ways we were leading, but in many ways he was. His affinity, his passion. You know, he's out of school at this point, but then he gets thrown out of it. He's 11 years old. He's getting a lot of speed, but he learned to read by reading credits. Because his motivation was acute. But he gets tossed out of this school, mostly for LD kids, some Spectrum kids. They say the Spectrum kids are too hard to teach, and now he does it. Look, he already has trouble with change. Now he's out of this place. He's bruised, he's really banged up, but he doesn't have enough speech to say how he feels. So he goes down to the basement with purpose. It's all. He stands at the top of the steps in the kitchen on his way down, and he says to us, he says, hold all calls, and goes out of the basement. I don't know what's that. We checked all the movies. <laughs> it's not in his name. Trust me. He must have heard me or Walter say it. I don't know. He was down there on some kind of project. I'm nosing around, I can't figure it out. Then about a month in, I see a pair. He begins drawing with peculiar ferocity. I see the pen and I open it. It's a 
face of Sebastian, and the little mermaid, a face of fear, when Ariel loses her voice. And then another Sebastian. And Jimmy Cricket, a moment of fear. And Cogsworth and the mare. <gasps> There are 100 sidekicks, no heroes. He saw what the world felt about him. He's not a hero, he's a sidekick. Thrown out on his butt by the kids moving forward, not him. There are 100 sidekicks. The end of the book in his scrawl, like a first grader, but legible, two things are written. I am the protector of the sidekicks. The last thing he writes is no sidekick gets left behind. That's what's going on inside of our friends with ASD. Everything. They're going deep. Get in there with them. Oh boy. So much in there. We all get psychic identities. He becomes an aficionado on the psychic. There are hundreds of them in Disney. Some resourceful, some goofy, some wise. Cornelia is either Big Mama from Fox and the Hound, or Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast. There's not a lot of women. All killed off all the women. <laughs> on a good year, I'm Merlin. That's a good year for me. We're a repeat. At one point, I don't know if you remember this from the news cycles. I was under investigation by the Bush administration. Remember that? It's like, it's a tense time in the Susquehanna household. That Father's Day, oh, gives me a card with a, with my sidekick for that year. It's Long John Silver from Treasure Pirate. I'm like, you're kind of a pirate now, Dad. But with a heart of gold. Thanks. And we went down and watched The Lion King. That part where they do the goose stepping march of the war. I was under investigation for documents leading to the war in Iraq. And Owen turns to me in that moment and says, Are we in trouble with George W. Bush? It's a kind of get it, actually. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay, back to the movie. The only one drawn as a hero is Walter. Only one in the family. And that's how we live our life. As sidekicks. As Owen will tell you, a sidekick helps the hero fulfill their destiny. That's their job. But suddenly there's a change. Right on, Owen's 14, Walt's 17, and at dinner one night, Owen's going on about the return of traditional hand drawn animation. And of course, Walt's like, Owen, oh, Owen, oh, I know you love the hand-drawn stuff, but you draw. But you know, ever since Toy Story 1995, it's kind of curves. They're putting out two computer animated movies a week. You're the only one who cares this much. Owen's oh, face sags. Walt says, hey, well, hold on a second. If you want traditional hand-drawn animation to come back, like Dumbo and Peter Pan, you gotta lead the charge. You gotta step up. Now, as Owen's parents, we never challenge him this way. We want to make it easy for him, cushion his path. Suddenly, he's being challenged with the only hero in the house. Walt says, you've been watching these movies since you're a little peanut. You got any ideas in there? Something. And he gets that look, just like he did in the kitchen with Owen and Peter Pan. It's a funny bubble up look. He says, I do have one idea. Twelve sidekicks searching for a hero. And in their journey and in the obstacles they face, each finds the hero within themselves. And that is Owen's movie. I just want to thank the extraordinary young people here for the first time animated that movie. That's Owen's movie. No one's ever animated before. Owen's going to be so crazy excited that someone animated that story. The story of a boy at three, Randall's age, 
Call some Timothy and tell him. The storm comes from the horizon. The boy is scared. He runs into the night. He gets lost. He crosses a bridge that collapses behind him. He can't make his way home. He ends up in the forest, a dark forest. She says, it's the land of the lost sidekicks. They say, why are they lost? She says, their heroes have already fulfilled their destiny. They have no purpose. What do they do? They take the boy as one of their own, a sidekick kitty. They tell stories of what was once, well, adventures past. But there's evil in the forest, real villains. And they will have to face them without heroes. So they look for the qualities of the hero within each other. The way are only sidekicks. As Owen says, you don't get redrawn in this life. That's the story of our life. We are in an extraordinary moment of possibility. It's because of the power of story. People are getting it. This is one story, but of course, it's a story replicated by thousands, maybe more. I'll finish with two skips and then we're, we're out to present in Q&A. Owen goes to college, college like program, okay, top. For kids on the spectrum mostly. Gets there, first thing he does, he starts Disney Club. He wants friends. All of a sudden, there are 12 kids in the room, just like them. Cornelia and I, I'm a writer of residence in Harvard. We drive down for the Disney Club, the first one. It's a whole room of moments. Many of them didn't live, none of them lived in a crazy house like we had. Many of them were ABA kids doing behavioral stuff. Some of them just sort of drifted along. Almost all of them were told, turn off that obsession. That's not age appropriate. Stop doing that. Do what you're supposed to do. But all of a sudden they're in the room because the affinity, the passion did not diminish. Maybe it even grew stronger. First night they're watching Dumbo. Great choice. I say to one young lady, I say, tell me about Dumbo. She says, it's my favorite movie. I say, why? Well, um, Dumbo was an outcast, and I've been an outcast. And the more I watched, the more I realized that, you see, Dumbo was different. And the thing that made it his strength in his ears, and it allowed him to soar. And that's what I've learned about my life. What makes me different is my greatest strength. That's why I'm a Dumbo girl. All needed to hear that that is his girlfriend now. Like, don't go, girl, that's my girl. You've been going out two and a half years. But in that opening meeting, there's a kid sitting there that's like a cosmic joke on both of us, on me and Cornelia. He's almost identical to the Rain Man guy, the thing we fear. His name is Josh. I say, Josh, which character have you bonded with? Many of the non-speaking kids bond with non-speaking characters. It's no, it's, it's no surprise. They express all emotions without words. Who's your person? He says, uh, Pinocchio. He said, Pinocchio, why? Then the dorm counselor, who told us Josh didn't come, he's got no emotional core that can be reached. He's got behavioral issues. He'll probably be thrown out of the school soon. It's just brief. She says, Josh, is that because of issues of truth? He's autistic. He can't tell anything but the truth. He says, no, no, no. It's, it's just because I feel like a wooden boy. And I have always dreamed of feeling what real boys feel. And I was born Mr. Susskind with wooden eyes. So hard to see. I defy you to produce any 18-year-old neurotypical kid who can summon that level of personal insight on cue from a work of art. You're not going to find it. Three years later, there are 50 
kids at Disney Club. There are five boy-girl couples. That's right. And when I go, they're delivered. They're giving me better stuff than the kids at Harvard are giving me. What do they care about? Oh, give Professor Susskind what he wants on a silver platter with a garnish so I can get my ticket punched to the business school. I don't want to criticize those people. They're Martin, they're Middle League champion students. I'll be frank about it, get better stuff from Disney Club. <laughs> I'm not thinking about what I want, they're thinking about what they know. They're worth it. Just like artists do. Just like philosophers do. And there's strength in numbers. That's the beauty of it. We notice each other. Parents call up and say, what's happening? My child is talking in ways they never had. The dorm counselor says, he says nothing all week except in Disney Club on Sunday nights. All this is in the book. The fact is, is that all this is now everywhere. When the book came out in April, it created a big kaboom. And I got three calls. The morning after the extra ran in the New York Times. Just ran in the Sunday magazine, Monday morning, three phone calls. First call was from uh, Bob Iger. I never met him before. It was very emotional. He says, people are grabbing me in restaurants. I got a call from my ex-wife. She doesn't call that much. <laughs> he talked about psychics. Why is that so resonant with me? We talked about it. We talked about how art in society dresses people like I do, maybe even people like me, to redraw ourselves as heroes. I can tell you from interviews with presidents and CEOs at that minute, that's right, that's my good side. Yeah, I'm ready. That's the beginning of the slide. They cut themselves off from the thing that allowed for the transformation, the rise, the growth, and the connection to the everything. No one gets it. So after Iger gets off the phone on the Good Morning America that morning, we watch the show, another phone. I have an accent. He says, this is Macha Nasser, and I wondered if you would accept an invitation to speak the General Assembly of the United Nations. I, I thought it was a buddy of mine doing a prank. <laughs> I said, where are you? What is going on? This is, this one is a shtick. What are you doing? This is Baha Nasser. I am from the United Nations. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so I spoke to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And I ended up with a guy named Tom Insulkol, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health. I know Insult. Met him once during the reporting. He's like, You got a thousand emails, Ron? I got a hundred. This is a reversal of the telescope. We've been wrestling with these affinities and passions. We called them obsessions. We didn't know what they were. Now we see them more clearly. You've got to come to NIH to give a speech. Well, it'll be a big crowd. It'll be good. And then I testified in front of Congress. And my mother was prouder of me at that point. <laughs> the United Nations, which I think I'll leave you with. Which is a powerful expression. Not only who we are, but who we might be. So I'm giving a speech. I don't know if any of you have been to the UN. Uh, a lot of cement. It's kind of hard to raise a pulse. <laughs> Guys, you know, the guy from Berlin, we go, oh, there's not, not much going on. They're all there with the earphones. So I'm trying to get something going at the podium. It's World Autism Awareness Day. I'm the guy. <laughs> <laughs> trying everything. I'm ready to start juggling. 20, 25 minutes in, all of a sudden I look across the room, and the room is like, I mean, it's twice the distance of the door. And I see over there, our kids are in blue shirts, lighted up blue. They're wearing the shirts. They're all spectrum kids. 
They're all junior high school kids. About 20 of them. Wait a minute. All of a sudden, I realized this is the way I, I finish. This is the way I, I can get off the stage. I need an ending. I grab the mic off the podium and I walk across the great well of the United States. I mean, four football games. People are thinking I was leaving. They think I'm just going to walk out. I stop and I'm right there with them. They're all looking at me. I'm like, okay. So look, you know, I uh, am the father of a guy who started a Disney club, and I talk a little about Disney club, and there's an anthem they sing in Disney club. It's their anthem. And I, and I want to see if maybe we can do something. Now, now it's the last three verses from the I Wish song that Belle sings in Beauty of the Beast. Now, the I Wish song, for those of you who are not initiated, is every hero on the third scene in the Disney movie sings the I Wish song. The song of Yerky, the hope, well, I wish, I want, give me fruit. Beautiful song, this one. I say the last three verses, everyone in that? Mm hmm. They <laughs> all know it. So I want you to sing it loud for, well, everyone. Ready? And for once it might be grand, she sings, to have someone understand. I want so much more than they got planned. And they sang that to the United Nations on that day. And we got a pulse raised. To do that. So that's what they're saying to us. We want so much more than we got planned. Make it happen. Look within yourselves, as Owen says. So now, Let's watch a short video. This is Owen, he is current life. I teach at Harvard, and this boy, with his measurable IQ of 74, has taught me more than anyone else in my life. That's the way life really works. If you're lucky, he made us lucky. Would we wish this on him? No. But who knows what life holds? Life is what you make with what's in front of you. You won't know that. <clears throat> And he taught us to make our life in a way that let us grow. How many times did I look to the stars as a boy, looking for a sign from my father? Just give me a sign, anything. Is this the life? Is this the life of work? Someday, Owen will look to the stars. I think and I hope you'll hear our voices. And I hope it's a voice that understands how the life of work sneaks up on you, surprises you, takes you in directions hopefully that you never expected. Worthwhile, worth its while, never long that while lasts. You know, each of us are part of this conversation. How many times have we seen someone who doesn't fit? Someone who is the outcast. Somebody who doesn't hit the bell as everyone else is told to. How often have we walked up to them and say, teach me what it's like to be you and I'll teach you what I see. How often? Well, this is the path. This is the path in which we find a deeper sense of ourselves. You know, at the end of the day, he ends up not being like us 
He ends up being more like himself. And that's really the goal. This is a movement now. It's everywhere. They're everywhere. A friend of mine who runs the Human Brain Project in Europe. <coughs> Biggest brain project in the world. Mapping the brain. 1.5 billion euros. 10 times what the American program is. He's got a son on the spectrum. So do you know what we call him here? Now that we've learned what we've already learned about the brain, we call folks on the spectrum scouts of humanity. Because they see everything. Not the save, sort, and discard stuff that we manage through our perceptual models. They see everything at once. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Too much. Too much stimulation they turn inward. But the fact is, they see reality, he tells me, the leading brain scientists in Europe, they see reality as it really is. We don't. Which is why they're so brilliant at recognizing the patterns of life. Ten years from now, it is my hope that everyone everywhere will know this. That when they see someone on the spectrum or many folks who are neurologically distinctive and differently able, they'll say, where are your compensatory strengths? It's not it, it's where. And that treasure hunt is one in which each of us, all of us, I pray to someday find our just rewards. And it happens on nights like this. So thank you for listening.